Okay, so we are now starting our next webinar. Thank you so much to Roy Burek of Charles Owen, who is joining us this morning to discuss replacing your helmet, when and why. Uh, good morning, Roy. Good, good, uh, good afternoon from uh, uh, sunny England. We're uh, fairly windy here, but uh, enjoying a little bit of summer for a change. So my understanding is, uh, or let's say uh, there's a common question, which is when should I think about replacing my helmet? Because there isn't a magic switch on there that says you need to go and replace it right now. So on the next slide, we can see that sometimes that question becomes a little obvious of when you would, and this is somebody who uh, had uh, a horse kick them in the head, and obviously this helmet is definitely in need of replacement. But many times it's not so obvious. And on the next slide, we can see some of the things that you should consider when you should replace it. The first one is when you've had a fall. A helmet is, dis is designed to absorb all the energy of the impact as you hit the ground or a fence. And, um, and we'll be talking a little bit more in detail about how helmets work and seeing how that uh, destroying energy is dealt with by the helmet. The next time to think about replacing your helmet is when it no longer fits. And, and that often happens when you go over those jumps or you have a slight buck from, the, from uh, your horse and you find that the helmet starts to slip down or it's not as snug as it used to. What happens is that when uh, we either cut our hair or change our hairstyle, um, we, we sometimes reduce our, our head size or if we're growing, then it actually starts to become too tight and it starts to give us a headache. So again, another obvious time to, uh, to replace the helmet. Now, after about, and we reckon about 2,000 hours of use. So this will be, you know, for some people will be a couple of years. Um, for others, it might be five or six years that uh, people are wearing it. And what happens when we wear a helmet is the perspiration from our head goes into the foam and the fitting bands inside and starts to break them down. And uh, with the uh, that material breaking down, we start to find that the helmet will, will be loose on our head and we'll start to get some motion. Now, the problem is, if you've got a helmet that's going to slide on your head, then when you land on the ground, it will not only maybe slip down and break your nose, but it can also um, expose the back of your head and you can end up with having uh, an injury, a major injury, because the helmet's not in the place that it used to, that it should be. Um, doing up the chin strap is, is a really important part of, the, uh, of this um, because uh, I have had to in investigate an accident where somebody landed on the back of their uh, head and the chin strap was really loose and the helmet tipped backwards and then they ended up having uh, the horse kick them in the temporal area and uh, they ended up having to have a lot of neurosurgery um, to have titanium plates put in that place. Luckily, they survived and they're back fully fit but um, if they'd only done that chin strap up, the helmet may not have tipped back and they would have been fine. Now, when you look at your user instructions, which I know everybody avidly reads from start to finish, um, you'll find that often there is a, a term in there that helmets should be replaced after five years. And the reason why the five-year life is put in is because helmet technology is always moving forward. And uh, in, a, in, relation, and in addition to that, helmet standards also change. Helmet standards are reviewed every five years, and uh, you will find that you know, between five and 10 years, there will be an update to a standard. For ASTM, the current um, standard is 2004, 
but in fact there will be a, uh, a change coming through in, a, in about a couple of years time where that uh, the protection will be upgraded and, and developed. Um, in Britain, the PASS standard, the one that we often uh, focus on preventing, that was recently revised in 2011. And in that standard, between 1998 and the 2011 standard, we've seen uh, in some parts of the test a, a nearly 30% increase in protection which is significant. So anybody that's got, that does eventing cross country and has got a PASS 98 uh, label inside their helmet, they should really think about going out to replace their helmet and, and upgrade to the 2011 standard. The European standard uh, has recently been republished as 2012. The previous version was 1996 and the, the thing, the thing, I'm on live, live radio. Um, the, uh, so, but with the European standard, there wasn't a huge change in that uh, update, and so therefore, um, uh, there isn't really a great need to go out and replace your helmet. Two times when people should perhaps think about replacing their helmet purely because their risk is increasing is when they have a new horse, uh, because a new horse, different manners, may uh, put put uh, the rider a little bit at risk, and maybe there's an opportunity for misunderstanding between horse and rider. And then finally, if you're starting a new level, maybe you're going from two six to three foot, or um, uh, you're starting in, uh, a new activity, maybe starting polo, or you're doing um, starting dressage because you've been inspired by the Olympics, then this is again a time when you're actually going to be pushing yourself and you won't necessarily know what's what's going on. So let's have a look at how helmets work and on the next slide um, we will uh, start to think about the, the, the major component inside the helmet which is the expanded polystyrene. Um, this is the major engine that uh, absorbs the energy and we sometimes refer it to it as microscopic bubble wrap. And in the next slide we can see an accident where those, those bubbles actually get crushed and absorb the, the, uh, the majority of the energy from the fall um, and uh, reducing the risk of um, a possible head injury. Now the technology we use inside helmets is very similar to the car industry and in the next slide we can see uh, a similar uh, situation where we have a, whole, uh, a car running into um, another one here and the front of the vehicles collapse and that collapsing, that crumple zone is very similar to the EPS inside and uh, will and all this destruction absorbs the energy of the impact rather than actually uh, having the, the passengers inside um, having to deal with it. So on the next slide um, we can see a rider that's falling and if we look at magnifying behind, so if we do the next, you will see that inside the helmet under magnification, if we do next, um, the beads of polystyrene are actually full of air bubbles. The air bubbles inside are hundreds and hundreds within each of the beads. And when we, um, when we impact on the next slide, we can see the bubbles actually collapse and squash and deform and that absorbs a lot of energy. And on the next slide, around each of the bubbles we actually have a plastic web strut of web, um, a web of struts and when we land after the bubbles we can see on the next slide how they compress and absorb more energy um, once the bubbles have, have collapsed and so we've got two different mechanisms that actually are going on inside that energy management system and if we look at the next slide, we can see some computer simulation that's going on. Um, here we have on the left-hand side 
a computer model where a, a, a rider is, um, uh, is coming in and hitting a flat steel surface. And on the right side, you can see how that flat surface um, deforms the, the helmet and uh, the stresses within the uh, helmet are, are shown in the various colors. Now, if we analyze that on the next slide, we can see some real science. And I apologize for the non-scientists uh, in the audience, but uh, for those who are interested, this is the sort of analysis we get to uh, into. Now, this, these graphs are showing the transfer of energy. And one of the things of nature is energy cannot be created or destroyed. It has to be transferred. So the red line, the kinetic energy, this is the energy of the movement. This is your speed coming in. We can see the line of the red line dropping down to, um, uh, to a low level. And that low level is when we come to a stop. And then as we bounce off the ground in the opposite direction, the speed, uh, the energy returns to the head. Um, but it's not obviously as much as what was incoming, i.e. when we hit the ground, we don't bounce up as high as where we started. So there's a loss of energy. And the blue line, the, the set of blue lines, the one at the top, shows that energy being absorbed by the helmet um, as, the red, as the red line decreases, the blue line starts to increase. Now that energy absorption is split into two parts. We've got the solid line, which has got the word bubbles on, and that's where we show, it's got uh, shown in the previous screen. This is where the bubbles burst, and obviously you absorb the energy, and when we rebound, bubbles stop bursting, and then we get into a flat line. So no more energy is absorbed. But those plastic struts uh, around the bubbles, what they do is they deform like a spring, uh, and you can see it rising up to a peak uh, in the dotted line. And then as we rebound, those plastic struts expand and almost propel us back off the ground. Now, um, the, if we look at the black line, this is actually looking at the polystyrene um, uh, thickness and you can see as you hit the ground the polystyrene compresses down to a, um, a very thin amount and then as we rebound mm -hmm. off the ground those plastic struts expand and we get some re-expansion of the polystyrene but obviously again not to the full amount that we had before and finally, the kind of the greeny, uh, the, the blue greeny line, which says peak G, that is actually um, the measurement of injury that we uh, that we use within the helmet industry. And you can see the peak uh, injury is just as we come to a stop on the ground, um, and then it drops away as we rebound. So on the next slide, we can uh, we can see. Um, a helmet, and where the red arrow is pointing, you can see the um, the expanded polystyrene has compressed and left a space between the inner side of the shell and the outer side of the expanded polystyrene. The problem with where it happens is that it's hidden away from uh, from uh, the naked eye. Uh, you have to take the helmet apart to see this damage that's occurred um, because it's between the shell and the expanded polystyrene. And on the next slide, we can see a helmet. Um, oh, no. Um, we've, uh, OK. Uh, on this slide, um, this is an experiment that was uh, conducted by um, Professor Gilchrist in uh, UCD in Dublin. And the purpose of this is that he was, he was uh, impacting the helmet with that flat surface representing the ground. And on the next slide, you can see um, what the results were of those impacts. Um, firstly, after one impact, um, on the top, you can see very little damage on the outside of a cross-country helmet. 
but if we look on the inside edge, which is directly beneath it, you can see that there's some white crack lines which show where the resin um, is telling us that the helmet has deformed, but it's actually not broken enough to start to disrupt the structure. The, um, the next one, we, uh, we can see the second impact on the same spot. Sorry, uh, if you can go back to the previous slide, Lindsay. Sorry, on the, on the strike two, we can see how the impactor is now starting to break up the surface and, we're, and inside you can get in more and after five impacts you can see we're really starting to break up the shell um, and these impacts are not catastrophic like um, perhaps that helmet where the horse is kicked this is representing a fall onto a, a, a sand um, a rough ground that sort of thing so um, from the uh, general person, you can see uh, that actually damage is happening, but it's not necessarily apparent. Now, on the next slide, we can see what the impact, and as we said before, the um, acceleration, the G, is a measure of injury to the, um, to the user, and here we've got um, the black line, the lowest line of the of of all the uh, sections, where you've got a, you know roughly a hundred units of injury, but on the subsequent impacts that degrades um, to 150, going up to 180, 190, and the reason for that is that the first impact we had bubbles, in the second and subsequent impact we had some residual bubbles but we're re now relying much more on that plastic strut work to uh, take to absorb the energy so every time we land on a helmet even though we can't see injury we are losing performance and on the next slide um, we can see um, we often are asked about what do, what do manu how, how do can manufacturers um, uh, how do they look after replacement policies and things like that? Well, some manufacturers do give a discount um, if you um, contact them and help them in their research of how helmets perform. It's incredibly important for people to report accidents and report their, um, uh, their findings because how do you make a better helmet if you don't know what's actually happened? We can do it in the test lab, we can do it in the computer, but there's nothing like hearing and seeing what really happens um, in real life. Now, at the moment, most of these um, uh, replacement policies are focused on North America. Um, and you have to be careful that if you do live in North America and you do buy it out of country, that sometimes the policy will not transfer to you. Um, uh, even though you are residing in North America uh, and if you've traveled to Europe or you've gone on the internet um, to uh, to buy a helmet sometimes the policies do don't transfer um, so the best thing um, you can do is to contact the company or the stockist where you're buying it and see if they know what the current policy is for the for the helmets that you're considering they do change over time um, and that's why it's very difficult with something like this to actually say uh, exactly what the policy is for you. But helmet manufacturers are very interested in what goes on with helmets. And uh, in fact, sometimes you can even be offered a, um, a check of a helmet. If you send the helmet in, the manufacturer um, sometimes takes it apart will give you um, a, uh, uh, some indication of uh, how much destruction took place to the helmet uh, when you had your fall. So replacing your helmet is really important. Um, it is the most critical thing, a helmet and riding. There's no other bit of equipment that you have that actually uh, really looks after your uh, life and uh, looks after disability and making sure that it's up to date, it fits well, and fitting of helmet is crucial, is absolutely crucial. 
the number of times I've been out to uh, colleges and, and found people wearing helmets three sizes too big, it, it's really quite um, unnerving. So do do go and, and when you look to buy your new helmet, you need to make sure it feels snug, it feels firm, it's going to be a little bit like a new pair of boots, so don't expect instant comfort, you know, and the more times you put the helmet on and off, the more it will break down, because the difference between a hat size is only one sixteenth of an inch in thickness. So thank you very much, and hopefully uh, that has uh, helped you uh, be more educated on uh, uh, helmets and how they protect you and when to replace them. Thank you so much, Roy. That was a great presentation. Very, very interesting. Um, we do have some questions for you. Um, there's a question here. Um, I think it's really that it's a rider that's basically fallen off a horse and she said she did hit her head, but it wasn't a serious accident. It wasn't like where she hit it against a fence or a really heavy blow. But how does she know whether she should actually really replace that hat or not? Because it doesn't appear to have any damage. She said she hit her head, but it was a kind of slow motion fall hitting the ground. Okay. Um, the Obviously, if one's going to be ultra safe, then, um, and you don't want to take risk, then you should replace your helmet every time you fall from your horse. Now, there are obviously many people in uh, listening to that and saying, oh my God, I fall off every day. I couldn't, I'd have to give up riding because I could never afford to replace my helmet so frequently. Um, in reality, when we actually see, um, see helmets, um, there are, the, if you feel that you've hit your head and or you know you've hit your head um, with some force then you definitely should replace it uh, there is no doubt you can see from the science that's been done there is a reduction in, in protection um, but if you for example have sort of fallen on uh, on your back and really just rolled onto your head and really you didn't feel that you hit your head then you probably haven't done very much damage to the helmet and you might decide to take the risk and continue to use it. But um, it's, it's a risk that everyone has to take. Uh, I mean, obviously getting on a horse is, is, a, is a risk in itself. Um, but um, it's, uh, I normally find that when I talk to people, they normally are talking to me, when we see a significant damage on the inside of the helmet, they say, oh my goodness, I felt I hit my head, I, um, I, I landed on my head, and in those circumstances where you take a direct impact, you really should be looking at replacing your helmet. I have another question here for you, Roy. <laughs> and James says he apologizes it's not to do with um, helmet replacement so much, but he said he has a very big, very large head. Um, and he says he's struggling to buy, he says he currently has a Charles Owen, struggling to buy a hat that fits, but he finds that um, the tack shops charge him more for a large size helmet and he wants some help, please. Okay, um, we do, um, I mean when the, um, uh, the USHGA originally put in their helmet rule for young riders, um, we actually committed as part of that uh, helmet rule going in that we would actually invest um, quite a lot of money to develop tooling to take um, the helmet sizes up to a size 8 in steps and hat sizes. Um, we do get our adult head size for girls between the age of 11 and 12 and for boys between 13 and 14. So obviously the under 21 rule meant that a 13 year old girl uh, or, um, or boy would actually require a, a very large adult head size even at that young age. Um, we, so if you are having you know, um, certainly we don't normally recommend a different price um, for a different size helmet um, but I do understand that maybe having to you know mail in uh, they might not be offering the same discount for a, for a, for a helmet 
But if you want to contact us on our website, we'd only be too happy to find a retailer in your area um, that will actually you know, look after you and maybe on the phone it's easier to guide on how to get the right sort of size um, uh, to start with. Um, we're kind of digressing here, Roy, but they're asking questions, so I'm going to ask you if I may. <laughs> um, okay. There's another question. A lady said that she bought a Charles Owen helmet approximately three weeks ago and went into a tack shop to be fitted, but she's a bit concerned because she's still having quite a bad headache wearing a hat. What would you suggest? Do you, um, I think her question is, should she go back to the tack shop that she bought it from? Because she, she feels that perhaps the helmet's a bit too tight. Right. Okay. Um, yes. Trying to trying to get that balance. All of us have a different sensitivity to our to um, help with tightness. I mean, there's sometimes when I fit people, um, especially people who go racing, uh, they 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 want the helmet not to move at all, and you're putting on a helmet, and you you kind of almost feel that their blood's going to be you know their eyes going to be popping out of their head because it's so tight. And yet other people, you put the helmet on and it's perhaps one size too big and they, they automatically say, oh my goodness, that's so much pressure, I can't deal with it. So as a, as a retailer, it, you try to, to go in and do a happy medium and, and helmets only tend to grow, so often retailers will err on the size of caution and uh, fit slightly on the small side. I definitely go back. Uh, as I said, to, uh, I think before, the best way to try to get a helmet to grow is to keep putting it on and off the head. That stretching uh, action, um, you know, wear it around the house and, um, you know, just um, because when you get pressure on your head, what happens is your head expands against that pressure. And so because your head is expanded, you get more pressure. And so therefore, the, you have this vicious cycle. Now, when you take the helmet off, what happens is your head says, oh, no more pressure, and shrinks back. But, of course, the helmet's been stretched in that particular part. So trying the helmet on two, you know, um, uh, half a dozen times to start with, and then just wearing it. And if you find that after wearing it around the house, you know, and just taking it off two or three times, you still find that it's, it's too tight, then... Um, definitely go back to the retailer that you you bought it and um, and try the next size the next size up. What there is a very standard technique to make sure the helmet doesn't slide forwards, and occasionally we have problems where the shape of the helmet isn't the same shape as the person's head, and that can create the pressure points which create the headache. But again, if you do have a problem, please contact us. Um, by, uh, on the website and we will uh, be happy to uh, phone you and talk to you on the phone and between us we can probably figure out what the, what the right, co right uh, course of action is. Fantastic. We've got another one that's coming on email here from Emily and it says um, the, the, the gist of her email is basically that she's had her helmet for about three years it isn't yet five years old, which is the, the recommended for at least replacing it if it's had no damage. But she said the lining seems to have compressed quite a lot and she does wear it every single day. Um, she's wondering if she should perhaps go ahead and change it because the lining almost seems to have compressed inside the helmet. Well, that's if, if, you, if we go back to um, one of the early slides, which was listing the reasons for uh, replacing a helmet, um, whilst I, we put in the time limit of five years, and of course, um, five years is maybe, for, each, for example, a show helmet where you're not using it very often, and so therefore, really, we're talking about technology changing um, that might uh, be affecting the protection level. What was good five years ago is no longer acceptable today. But above that, you can see after about 2,000 hours of use, um, so if you kind of think of work out how how many hours you, you use it in a week, um, you it's a, it, I would have thought that if you are using it on a daily basis, that probably three years is going to be the life of the helmet. Um, you know the 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 sweat and the uh, acid from the uh, from the sweat goes into the foams and it does start to break them down. 
and as I said before, it only has to collapse by a sixteenth of an inch, and you're now into the next helmet size. So uh, if it collapses by an eighth of an inch, which is not very much, um, you could be two sizes too big. But that is the the major reason why you should think about replacing the helmet is, um, and of course, being International Helmet Awareness Day, today is the day to take advantage of all those great discounts out there. Great, and then this <laughs> this one's quite entertaining. It isn't so much a as a question, Roy, as they wanted to pass on their thanks. That um, there's a lady that's had a Charles Owen helmet. She said, and when she fell off and it got a crack in it, she decided to use it as a flower pot, and it makes a very nice one in her stable yard. So <laughs> that's great. So we're now recycling helmets into um, flower pots. So she wanted to pass exactly. On. No, I've I've heard that <laughs> one before, and I think it's a great use. I mean, the harness does. <laughs> Does produce great um, uh, fixing points uh, for the uh, for the flower pot, and of course the uh, expanded polystyrene does keep the frost away from the roots, <laughs> uh, and it will allow your flowers to flower for longer. Fantastic. Well, I think that's it on the questions for now. Thank you so much for joining us, Roy. We really appreciate you coming on this morning. And honestly, that was very, very educational. I learned some new things, certainly from your PowerPoint as well, that I was not aware of. Um, we will make this live and available on the Riders for Helmets website this week um, so that additional people can see it. So thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day at Hickstead. Well, thank you, Lindsay, for making, you know, putting all the hours and well it's more than hours it's more like weeks of your life into this into this campaign um, a lot of the changes wouldn't have happened I'm, I'm not sure that the FEI rules would have come about without somebody really focusing on the on the benefit of helmets and the need to make sure our sport is safe because if we have a safe sport then pe more and more people will enjoy the benefits of the horse and that, well, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And we certainly appreciate Charles Owen uh, participating for the fourth time now in International Helmet Awareness Day. Um, so if you're looking for a new Charles Owen hat, today is the day to go out and purchase one. You can visit ridersforhelmets.com backslash IHAD and find your nearest Charles Owen retailer uh, tax shop that will be offering a special discount today only. Thank you so much, for Roy. Thank you. Bye bye from the All English, uh, All England jumping course in Hickstead. Thank you.